Thank you, Manjula. Uh, any new technology brings uh, benefit as well as risk. They're all double-edged weapons. Uh, when I got the request to chair, I was just thinking, uh, taking me back 30 years, when Human Genome was announced, big discussion, ethical, legal, social issues, how confidential it will be a problem, how right to know, right to refuse to know. So I have been part of that genome debate, and I had the privilege of participating in years later, if somebody asks you, would you like to have a genome? You say, yeah, yeah, it's a fashion statement. I've got my genome done. Uh, would you like to make your genome publicly available? I'll be surprised to tell you, 100 people, 90 years plus, in India, have voluntarily agreed that they have no patient, no, no disease, they are healthy, they wanted their genome to be used for living health well, and they are not very really educated, but they have given it open. It's available in my institute, IJB. So what I meant that AI brings the same thing, right? How do you handle artificial intelligence? I know Google is sitting in this room, somebody from Google? Yes. Uh, who actually knows me and Vasanta is sitting next to each other because our, both our four are co-located. So I don't know today, uh, invasive world of knowledge, the way technology has invaded in our personal life, how much we should worry about confidentiality and other issues. You know, these are big debates. As long as we don't do harm to each other, and we don't use the technology for negative purposes. And this debate was in 40s about atomic energy. And even Albert Einstein could not stop the drum bomb to be dropped. All of the scientists built it. So when it came to human genome projects, scientists were cautious. They made sure that nobody owns the intellectual property. So same way, I think there's a time today to ask how do we use this super powerful technology for the benefit of the people and not monopolize and colonize using this technology. And I think that's a challenge. I'll leave it open to person that to start. You can use the mic, I think. No. Uh, I think. Oh, okay. Presentation. Presentation. Anyway, presentation. So the format of the panel okay, discussion is that Dr. Vasanta will present uh, with her presentation for five it, around, and then we can have questions which will be directed by uh, Dr. Vasanta, and all other panelists will uh, be helping in the discussion. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers, and thank you very much to Dr. Brahmachari. I remember the days when we started the genome funding in ICMR. He was one of the first scientists to get the funding from ICMR. And we have been discussing about ethical issues and various aspects. The whole area of medicine, when we look at the, from the ethical perspective, we have come from the, we have moved over from the area of diagnostic medicine to therapeutic medicine, to preventive medicine, predictive medicine, regenerative medicine. Then we came into the area of genomic medicine. Then we came into translational health and then we are then we came into the entire area of bioinformatics, which was funded in a very big way by the ICMR. And uh, when I was in ICMR, and now we have moved on to this area of artificial intelligence. Because science is galloping fast. As science gallops fast, uh, there are a lot of issues, very interesting. Everybody loves to have, uh, of course, new technologies, innovative technologies. Ethics is always slow to catch up because only when something goes wrong, when something somebody is worried. Something is probably not in the right way. Then ethics, uh, ethic, ethicists start thinking about it, and the ethical issues. By the time, there are a lot of things which we have made bills in this country, which are all still pending to see the light of the day. 
So always we say the science is very fast, ethics is slow, and the law is even slower. So we are now in a session where we are going to have ethical issues in the first half of the session and the legal issues and the, the regulatory aspects in the second half of the session. So it's very interesting how everything is evolving. Of course, when we come to the technologies, innovation is, the, is needed. It is what is the, the mantra of the day. We have to have new innovations. Innovation has come into everything. But then with the innovation, of course, the way we adopt it and implement it, there are a lot of questions. So these are areas where there are more questions, less answers. There are a lot of gray areas. And we always think of new technologies that we look at it for the precautionary principle. In case something goes wrong, what is it which we'll have to look into that. So precautionary principle is what we always adopt when we are looking at the new technologies. So here we'll just look into the, there are few initial few slides, I'll not go into the detail, I'll just skip over because I mean, I made this uh, presentation long back when I was asked, and there was supposed to be a presentation separate. Now that is the panel discussion, I'll just skip over it. Only the last few slides are related to the ethical issues. Now, of course, we, will, we are not going to talk here what is artificial intelligence. We've been talking about technology from the morning. We have a whole lot of speakers who told us what is artificial intelligence and what do we mean by the problems arising out of the learning and then the uh, how the machines can work like a human uh, brain and what is happening. And we have also looked into the global challenges in this area, and that's what is important. We have a growing world population, aged population. So we are going, we are, this is an area we have to deal with a lot of vulnerable population, like children and old people. Of course, there is definitely, we heard many percentages, people talking about the different service providers that they said there is going to be a lot of provider shortfall, which is where the machines are supposed to come into intervention to see that we take care of that shortfall to see that nobody is uh, deprived of the health care that is needed by them. Of course, a developed world is already an aging developed world. We have more younger people in the developing countries than in the developed world. And that itself is a great problem which we are facing. And of course, the chronic as well as the preventive diseases, the, the epidemiological studies which we are doing and the big data which is available to us, how we are going to, how we are handling it already and what are the issues which are anticipated. Of course, this is something which, again, we have been hearing from the morning. What are the growth drivers as far as the artificial intelligence in healthcare is concerned? We have a whole lot of things, the physician, the interface, the machines, how they interact, and what is it, what is the kind of information. So we have had already interesting presentations on this. And of course, when it came to the innovations, we have seen from the 50s, early 50s, that innovation is happening in a big way. And this innovation, the emissions are the ones which have taken the maximum uh, the, uh, the gain in this thing that we have so many new machines which have come to the existence, making our life easier in many ways, at the same time raising many of the issues. So biomedical engineering and medical engineering have become a big area. And this is, of course, a whole lot of uh, the areas that uh, from the new generation of the medical technology, which is not the consistent traditional products, which we have all the new products related to the new technologies, the genomic medicine and the genome developed products and all these others, which are the, the chips and the information. So these are all the, so we have the traditional technologies, the new technologies, and we have the convergence of the old and the new. And then what are the issues that to, to take care of the old ones to remove them or get into the new one and we are having situations where we cannot do away with the old technologies at the same time the new technologies are coming in how we can make it an affordable technology so that uh, people are able to use it now artificial in intelligent medicine of course all, all of you know that we have two branches one is a virtual branch where it comes that all these diagnostics and the medicine uh, learning issues the distinction with the learning, the algorithms, all this come in the virtual branch. And we also have the lot of benefits of, again, the artificial intelligence, which again, we have been hearing. The artificial intelligence also has a physical branch, which is the actual, the physical objects, the medical devices, and then the robots. The robots. The robotic surgery which is being done, how the robots are now taking care of many of the issues they are capable of doing many things now that constitute the physical branch of the artificial intelligence. So we are, when we are looking into the, the virtual branch which has it got its own and we also have the physical branch, we will have to look into that, that how far we can go about it, how uh, trustworthy they are and what is it which we can do about it. Of course, use of robots have to have really produce a lot of effectiveness, efficacy. But then, of course, the issues we have to do a constant monitoring to see that the about the reliability and the trustworthy of all these new technologies. 
the potential challenges were there. I think probably I'll have to stand here. I am not able to read it. Yes. So when we, oh, it's also anyway when we look at the potential challenges in this area, which also which has its impact on the how we look at it from the ethical perspective. What are the development costs? What are the integration issues? as far as the, the, the service part, as well as the ethical issues. The reluctance among many medical practitioners to adopt the AI technology because of fear of replacing humans. The data privacy and the data security issues, the mobile health applications and devices, which are using the artificial intelligence and the lack of interoperability between the various AI solutions is a major issue at the moment. Then of course the data exchange, need for continuous training by the data from clinical studies. What is the incentives for sharing data, which we had that many hospitals refuse to share the data. We had this presentation in the morning. So while sharing data is important to reduce the cost as well as the time frame, but then it's also really raises a lot of issues which people are not willing. So the incentives for sharing data and the system for further development and the implementation of the entire AI system. And all the parties in the healthcare system, the physicians, the pharmaceutical aid companies, and the patients, they all have their greater incentives to compile and exchange information if they really we want to have a holistic system. And then, of course, we have to look into what are the state regulations, what are the central regulations, and we do have any regulations at all in this area. And if regulations are there, we'll have to see that there's no distinction between these regulations. Of course, we are going to have the next session on regulations. So rapid and iterative process of software updates commonly used to improve existing product services. So updation is taking place in such a great speed that itself is a big issue as to which one do we use, which one we do you avoid, and what is the one which is to be scrapped and to be accepted. So we have this whole lot of challenges. Of course, industry faces a lot of challenges, which are not going to the details of the industry's challenges. But the key takeaways is, yes, artificial intelligence will enable preventive and precision medicine. It has its positive effect. It has to it will improve patient experience, access, and outcomes. It augments the intelligence of the clinician and remove the non-value added work many times so that the clinicians can concentrate more on the clinical work of diagnosis and therapeutics. It creates increasing opportunities for corporates, clinical co-creation and innovation. It answers, of course, global healthcare challenges. Create the perpetual global clinical trial, what it is, how it has to be used. And it allows us to know our patients like never before. As we say that we, you know, we have more thorough information about the patients than what we had before because of this technology. Of course, as we all been hearing that a lot of initiatives have taken in the recent years about developing guidelines for artificial intelligence and ethical and legal issues. Many agencies, many countries are in that. So we have the UK government center of data ethics and innovation last year. We have the Ada Lovelace Institute of Nafil Foundation, which has come out with its own guidelines. Partnership on the A between Amazon, Apple, DeepMind, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, IBM, so all the great industries are all now involved in artificial intelligence and coming out with guidelines. IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent System from 2016, it's happening. Of course, the Asilomar started the original on biotechnology issues in 1976. They also have come out with the Asilomar, the artificial intelligent principles developed in 2017. The House of Lords Select Committee on Artificial Intelligence, the European Group on Ethics and Science and Technology has come out with guidelines in 2018. And of course, more recently, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan was also referring in the morning that there is a WHO consultative meeting on artificial intelligence this year. So we see that in the last two, three years, there is plenty of efforts are going on in this area of looking into the ethical issues. It's not about artificial intelligence as a whole, it's happening for many years just looking into the ethical issues pertaining to this new technology and its adaptation. So if you look at the ethical and social issues in this, of course it's an overlap which is raised by the data use. The main thing is the big data which is coming, huge amount of data available, the automation which has happened, the reliance on technologies and more broadly and issues that arise with the use of assistive technologies, telehealth. Now all these, so the entire new issues related to the ethics are all based on only data, data, data. So all experts, who have been doing, working on the genomic data, working on big data, with huge national surveys, and they're the ones, and this data is the one which has now come into this whole category. The issues are, have you looked at the reliability and the safety of the data, the transparency and the accountability? What is the data bias we should have, will have, we have? 
Are we fair in the dealing with this? And is there any equity issues? Is that some are getting more benefited and those which are underprivileged as it is, they have problem or they are not able to access to the new technologies? Are we depriving them more? So is it uh, balancing the equity or the do's and have's and have nots are increasing in this because of these technologies and the available issue in inputs? What are the effects on patients? What are the effects on healthcare professionals? What is the trust? Total, of course, the whole technology is depends on trust which we have with each other, with the technology and the available data, people handling the data. Is the trust is complete? Is it 100% or there are doubts about it? The data privacy and, of course, security, data integrity, these are major issues regarding the data. There can be malicious use of artificial Any technology, when you come, why we are more worried is we are more worried about people who are using it for the wrong purpose, starting from atomic energy. We are all the way, almost always worried about the future use, going, using it for the wrong purpose than the right purpose. So here also it can happen. There can be malicious use of artificial intelligence and information for wrong purposes. And of course, the most important challenges of governance. How do we control all these things? How do we monitor? How do we implement? How do we monitor and keep track of what is going on and where possibility of something going wrong? So the challenge of governance is, which is something which is very important. This is, of course, the European Commission guidelines. Many of you would have read it, and some uh, many may not have read it in the in this audience. So I just thought that uh, since this is the latest which has come out, this is on guidelines for trust, trustworthy artificial intelligence, which is issued by the European Commission in 2018. And they say that ethical principles on artificial intelligence is you develop, deploy, and use AI system in a way that adheres to the ethical principles of respect for human and art, autonomy prevention of harm, fairness, and explicability. Acknowledge and address the potential tensions between these principles. Principles remain the same. Principles don't refer. We always talk of autonomy, benefits, and non values and justice. While the principles remain the same, application of these principles and the inter, uh, the tensions between these principles, when one principle is taken care of, there is always uh, the other principle suffers in the process, and that's what we'll have to see. So you have to pay particular attention to situations involving more vulnerable groups, such as children, persons, etc. So you have the whole list of vulnerable groups who are coming into the picture now with these new technologies. We'll have to see that because vulnerability is a major issue as far as Helsinki Declaration is concerned, as well as the WHO guidelines and even in the ICMR guideline, we have a separate section on vulnerability in the 2017 guidelines. So vulnerability is one of the major issues, and that's one group which will get affected in this. Acknowledge that while bringing substantial benefits to individuals and society, the AI systems also pose certain risks and may have negative impact, including impacts which may be difficult to anticipate, identify, or measure. Example on democracy and the rule of law, distributive justice, human mind itself, which may change. Adopt adequate measures to mitigate this risk when appropriate proportionally to the magnitude of risk. Then in the net is that you have to do a continuous risk benefit, which you always say for all technologies, you have to do a continuous risk benefit assessment. And this is a technology where it is, since they're constantly changing new things, we'll have to do a continuous risk benefit or a benefit risk assessment where benefit should be more than the risk. There, there are seven requirements to have a trustworthy artificial intelligence. That is human, ensure the development, deployment, use of these systems where human agency and oversight has to be taken care, technical robustness and safety of the techniques, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination, fairness, the same things in, in explained in different ways, environmental and societal well-being, and most important is the accountability of people who are handling these uh, systems. So we have to consider the technical as well as non-technical methods to ensure the implementation of these requirements. So this is the last slide. This is recently, it's a very interesting publication has come in the Nature Machine Intelligence, October 2019. And it's a very interesting article, which, is, uh, which says what they have done is they've looked into 84 publications on ethical guidelines, which are available at the moment in the world. Looking at that 84 uh, publications, they've found, they've tried to find out which are the ethical principles which are being mentioned more frequently in these guidelines. And if you see the left and the right side, left side, you have more than 50% what they are telling. The right hand side is the less than 50%. Transparency seems to be the most important in this. Transparency, explainability, explicability, understandability, interpretability, communication, disclosure. Okay. Second is the justice and fairness. That is 68 out of 84. Justice, fairness, consistency, inclusion, equality, equity, non-bias, non-discrimination. 
diversity, plurality, accessibility, reversibility, remedy, redress, challenge, access, all these come under justice and fairness. Then you come to non-maleficence, 60 of the publications have on non-maleficence, do no harm, that is security, safety, and all those things, responsibility, privacy. We go to the other side, of course, beneficence, trust, sustainability, dignity, solidarity. You know, these are all explained as the ethical principles, ethical issues when one has to we keep to keep constantly in mind when we come out with the other guidelines, when you are looking into this, how do we evaluate the proposals and on this. So I just stop with that because these are the issues which are there. I have the other panelists. Each one will take up the different aspects of this ethical mean from their own perspective, and they'll be able to explain more. Thank you, Dr. Vasanta. I thought I'll request the uh, next speaker, Dr. Esharif. Huh? Uh, just give your comments. We have no more presentation. I'll request Sarif, and then I'll ask Naomi Lee, and then Nandini Kannan, and Roli Mathu, one by one. So we started with the lady, the other man, and then we have ladies. Gender. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I thank the organizers and the ICMR for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, discussion. Uh, at the outset, I want to uh, clarify one thing that I am actually a techno buff and I have started the programming from my first MBBS that was about close to 40 years back. So later on, if I sound as if I am against AI, that should not be misunderstood. That's why I'm clarifying this. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am also looking after the IT division of AIMS. I am heading the IT division and uh, because of that status that I'm holding, I just have to clarify one of the points raised by a speaker earlier in the day, uh, who said that uh, the resources in AIMS are underutilized because of <laughs> no show up. <laughs> I didn't know that. It is the super overutilized. No, yes. Here I want to clarify here that see the, see the fallacy in the data. Data which is correct at one time should not be correct at other times. So there is a temporal aspect of data also, I think, which has to be kept in mind. Probably when he did the survey, that was the case. And I have been looking after from 2017. So in March of 2018, we changed our appointment system to give only 50% of the slots to the online and otherwise appoint prior advance appointments and rest of the slots were open for walk-in patients and follow-up patients, which most of them are, don't need any appointment, they can just walk in any time. And among the advance appointments also, whoever doesn't show up till a particular time, is a, that particular slot is released to the walk-in. So now you understand that there is no loss of, you know, uh, appointments because patients did not show up. So again, I think this is one of the fallacies. Probably this was an AI inference, which apparently seems to be wrong just now. <laughs> no, I, I think okay, yes. this is where the issue comes. How much data you capture, how you analyze, but common sense will go. You all you have. I, I have only hospital I've gone in Delhi is Ames. I can tell you go and see. How overutilized is the doctor's brain yes. in a hospital? Anywhere in the world is the highest utilized doctor's brain, you know, highest per rupee. If you ask rupee, so it is billions. It is just infinite. Yeah, more, yeah. We, we see more than 4 million patients a year. Uh, two and a half lakhs in patients per year. So you can imagine. And uh, there, is, there are limited resources like anywhere yeah, anyway let me continue now there is generally a feeling that uh, the clinicians are reluctant to uh, adopt or cooperate with ai or share data all these kind of things i think i'm uh, everybody agrees here uh, i would say the most affected stakeholders in this whole business and least profited are the doctors i will tell you why because, you know, there, is a, there are tensions, Madam was mentioning. What are those tensions here? The technology side, the techno world says, move fast and break things. 
and the medical practice says do no, no harm to the patient so there is a tension there now there is also another kind of tension you know the corporate world whether it is tech, tech company or the corporate uh, medical world whatever it is the, so i don't differentiate between the corporate is one and the other is non corporate medical practice so there is there is a tension you know corporate world is driven by profit and the non corporate world is driven by ethics again you can see a tension there so you will have to address these tensions and you cannot do this without the participation of the doctor the doctor has to participate right from the beginning we want this tool doctors are not against advancements you know that medical community takes up the advancement as far, i think probably most of the advancements are first applied in the war and then they come to the medical world or space for that matter so and they are adopted very fast and doctors are not one thing if doctors are reluctant there is one solid reason for that now doctors are put in a very responsible position without the power to do much like this suppose a doctor is using ai for treating his patient when things go well the credit goes to the ai yes, when things go wrong the doctor actually gets bashed up now the public doesn't understand machine accountability they don't they don't go and break the machine like they do in india you know they burn buses and they do all those kind of things probably i don't mind that as a doctor i am representing the clinician right i hope you understand this accountability without any power to modify and he doesn't even know how a particular decision is made same that black box make the black box less black so you better give mechanisms which will actually explain at least the doctor should understand how decisions are made so now this accountability this is the issue i think there there are many other things but uh, if if it comes up we will just talk about that i think here i would like to stop <laughs> Uh, I, Thank you. What I suggest that subsequently all of you make one point and pass on, then we can get back if we have yes. time. But yes, yes, time is little limited. Doctor Naomi, please. Yes. Sir, you can use the same. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this really interesting panel. I'm allowed to make one point, so I'll make it quite quickly. But um, essentially, what I uh, understood from your presentation this morning is that we already have a number of ethical frameworks. But I think where we am I too quiet? Okay, uh, okay, we already have a number of ethical frameworks that are emerging, thinking about AI. What we are now all kind of scrambling to do in different ways is to apply this to our own particular circumstance. And one of the circumstances that I think we have gathered to look at and I'm particularly interested in is how do you evaluate new technologies? So if you take that example of robotic surgery, there were no very few trials that were done in robotic surgery that, and so because of that, none of the individual studies were performed in opposition to the currently established ethical principles. All of those trials were done according to ethical principles. However, the situation with robotic surgery was that since the uptake is first introduction in the 1990s, for almost 20 years, it went from 5% of prostate surgery to 90% of surgery without any comparative effectiveness studies. So a technology that was incredibly expensive and nobody knew whether it worked better or not was taken up, not because studies were done because, against ethical principles, but because there were no studies done. And so what I'm interested in um, is when we're thinking about establishing an, a framework for evaluation, how do we build in those ethical principles? And so for me, one of the ideas that's come from this morning you know it's really been we all see this enormous potential and we're all here talking not to be the kind of naysayer but uh, how do we establish a framework which 
to some extent applies the brakes, but also to some extent provides the platform to speed up, to scale up and to establish the trust of clinicians. Um, and so when we think about establishing some kind of evaluation framework, which I think is essential to do all of those things, then I'm really interested in keep, how do we apply those ethical principles, the general ethical principles to this particular circumstance? So think about how situate the situation is currently, you know, regulation is relatively low. Um, the kind of ethic, ethical requirements are probably also quite low. However, that means that there's an enormous amount of innovation and that the playing field is relatively flat. Um, I think what we see, for example, if you think about a drug clinical trial, then the regulatory uh, requirements are high, the ethical frameworks are high, and the cost is high. So the playing field, especially when you think globally, is less flat. Um, so what I, you know, one of the kind of principles that I think when we're coming to talk about an evaluation framework is how do we maintain this situation, um, but also applying ethics and some of the kind of breaks. I mean, just to mention that of the research that we've published at The Lancet, one of the um, one of the few papers that we've published in AI is actually from India. And that for us was just so exciting because, you know, when you think about how much research we publish from India, it's not a huge amount. Um, so our idea is, you know, how do we apply those breaks, but keep those really exciting developments coming from places where we don't, you know, we don't see India in that major role in, in other trials. So, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, Dr. Naomi, I think uh, you are looking from a Lancet or Western perspective. I personally believe uh, India will give a different perspective to the whole AI. The reason is how well is AI doing makes sense when you have a doctor around. When there is no doctor around, then whatever AI does is good enough. So therefore, India has to be looked at, rural India, have and have nots. Yeah. This have not India is where it will be applied. Yeah. Whereas I personally feel the AI in Western world is going to be very complicated because it will be legal issues, lawyers will tear it apart. In India, it's completely other way. You know, this is the difference between, I say, Indian society with respect to human genome because we believe in palmistry, so we don't mind getting predictive medicine, preventive. For India, it will be preventive first. It is not at all, just analysis. You get a doctor's advice. You know, you don't need Dr. Anurag Agarwal to be telephoned. Anurag Agarwal will be available on an Alexa box yeah. in a rural India. That's the future. I think that's such an interesting perspective, and definitely I've heard that before. Um, and I completely acknowledge that, yeah, you know, obviously, I'm a medical doctor, but my background is absolutely in that kind of high income setting. I think where um, we feel cautious to some extent is that we have kind of at the Lancet lived through that era where lots of the drug trials were done in Africa. So absolutely. for exactly that reason of kind of, well, there's nothing. So whatever we can give is a benefit. Um, so I think there's a kind of element of caution there where you say, yes, as long as we have some idea that it's working to deliver benefit, because absolutely. what would be... What's exciting is when you use India and, you know, the kind of the young population, the size of the population, the amount of data to do exciting things. What's less positive is if you kind of uh, India would end up being that test, uh, test bed of something which, you know, then goes on to high income sure. settings that kind of is less comfortable. Yeah, that's, sure. that's very important because it's called in today's era, we can't compare a drug with a placebo. No. You have to compare drug with it. Another drug which is of standard. So something similar, I think Naomi is trying to tell. And we, we should be looking at a balance. Yeah, control. but I still believe the difference is yes. zero. I don't know how many of you lived in village of India, has seen a hospital in India at village. You'll realize there's zero doctor. When there's a zero doctor, right? Can we replace a machine which will at least help in telling, go to a doctor. You need to go to a doctor. You need to go to a district hospital. How do we, that's where the challenge is, and that's where you need quality data. Go ahead. Maybe to add to that, I just visited Portugal and some people that do, developed uh, a skin lesion app there, and they told me that uh, 
they showed it to a doctor, uh, a, a skin doctor, and and, and he then they said, well, you, it's not yet verified, it's not yet approved, and he said, well, I still use it. It's better than I, what I got. I, this is also some effect that we are observing. Like this is. It hasn't been even approved, and doctors just say, "Well, I still use it. I think it's better than what I got." It is similar to the, you know, the famous 076 anti-HIV trial in Africa. The entire ethicists of the world were up against it. That, you know, unethical trial is being done in Africa. It should not have been done. And but the the African government was very sure. They said, "We don't have any treatment for our patients. Are they are simply dying?" But them, even the partial treatment which is being is good enough. Actually, they are getting something. We don't think it is unethical. They have proved it. The entire world was against them, and the entire entire guideline, HIV guidelines came only because of that trial. But the Africans were very strong. They said, "We don't have anything for us. This was good enough. Why are you people telling it is wrong?" It's something similar to that. Where there's no doctor to treat, sir, sir, any treatment which is available is welcome. Yeah. So a different perspective, ma'am. I, I think I should put in here. Because we all think, you know, we all agree that uh, many of the places in India doesn't have a doctor. But then putting this kind of machines and this kind of algorithms, I may sound a little uh, pessimist in this area, but isn't it it's going to increase the difference or the distance between the doctor and the patient? Because if this happens, because pe people will continue to you know, believe, increase believe in these machines rather than in doctors, it is going to be a very dangerous situation. We'll so we have to into. develop a system. Yeah. where you it may you use a system up to the diagnosis part and then you'll have to have a method by which somebody yeah. looks at it and sees that what is there so sure. you'll have to develop an interface between that you can't totally say machine will diagnose will treat do everything so either of the two parts are not good there has to be a balance between yeah. the two yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll take the doctor and then we'll go ahead uh, thank you very much. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a doctor who is of any use to anybody in this room. Um, so I'm a statistician. useful from a data perspective. So I'm a statistician by training. And just as a quick background, um, I came from the National Science Foundation and I'd done some work with the National Institutes of Health around data science, AI, and machine learning. So it's an to add to the discussion. Um, one question I've heard often this morning is about this whole idea of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Um, one of the issues, you also talked about the black box. Um, a lot of AI machine learning is done by computer scientists and statisticians and mathematicians sitting in isolation, developing these super fast algorithms uh, if you look at the NeurIPS papers, they are wonderful. Um, I can give you data on a single paper. NeurIPS costs about $200,000 in GPU time to produce just because of the number of um, images they're using. So it's incredible, but it's all about achieving a small percentage increase in accuracy. So now if you take that to where we're looking at the intersection of AI and health and machine learning and health and data science and health, what you really need is true transdisciplinarity. Um, I, I see a lot of medical doctors here who have a fantastic knowledge of data science, which is incredible. But I would turn the flip the switch on the other side and say most data scientists, uh, and I'm going to make generalities and somebody in the audience is going to say, no, I understand enough about the medical field. It's you need people to work as a team. And often the black box happens because you have algorithms that are repurposed, that are not explainable, uh, that are not fair. So if you apply the FAIR principles to AI, um, I think that's something as policies and as governments and organizations, we need to be talking more about. Uh, there's this whole area of algorithmic fairness now that's a fairly active area in machine learning and AI. Uh, there's even conferences around algorithmic fairness. So how do you actually find out if an algorithm is fair? And part of the question today I've seen is, it's not just data quality. Uh, data quality is one aspect. You know, in the morning somebody talked about the three pieces. It's the data side, it's the algorithm, and then it's the decisions that are made. Um, data quality is critical when you're trying to do something like precision medicine and you're working with mass amounts of data that are heterogeneous 
A very few of the algorithms actually look at quality across and between data sets. Uh, some people talked about causal inference. Causal inference in AI is a hot area. A lot of the algorithms do associations and correlations, but they're nearly not talking about causality. And again, that part of what's missing is the transdisciplinarity, having that conversation between the clinicians and the computer science, the data science on the other side. Um, one of the other issues I want to bring up is, you know, the whole notion of data privacy. Uh, it's been brought up by some of uh, the folks from Microsoft and Google. Um, data use, one of the big things that for the governments and for agencies is to develop some sort of open platform for sharing data um, and having metadata, which I think is something uh, I know some of you sort of briefly alluded to. Unless you have metadata ontologies set up uh, and incentives for people to put in data from different trials, you really are not going to harness the power of AI. Uh, AI needs huge amounts of data. Uh, just having a population of the size of India is not going to be enough if the quality of data is not there. So unless you have randomized clinical trials and use AI to develop those types of trials, have those sort of data sets available, curated, because it's not just putting the data out there. Somebody has to curate and maintain those data sets. Um, make sure you have interoperable systems. Uh, those are all sort of platforms you need to put in place for data science and AI to be, the power of that to be truly realized. And I'm all for transdisciplinarity. Uh, one thing I would urge in all the conversation of research and AI, we haven't talked about the workforce. How do you train clinicians to understand how to use these technologies, understand what the predictions are actually doing, so it's explainable AI. On the other side, data scientists need to be taking more ethics courses. Um, and at NIH, they actually developed a curriculum. They had clinicians and biomedical researchers, and they developed ethics courses for them. But there are also ethics courses for data scientists. Thou shall do no harm with data. I mean, you take your Hippocratic oath that many of the doctors in this room know so well, and you take every word there about patients and change that to data. You know, there is a lot of there is a tendency with a lot of data science to just speed up algorithms, uh, but a lot of that involves tweaking. I'm going to use the word very broadly. Uh, so algorithmic fairness is a way to get around that. Uh, so that's an area where I think AI uh, and people who set policies really need to enforce how you can actually get explainable, transparent AI <laughs> metrics and definitions of uncertainty. Uh, so that's sort of my plea to the room open access, shareable ontologies, platforms for sharing, and then requiring explainable and fairness in AI through sort of defined metrics. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Can I raise the question, Roni? Thank you, sir. Uh, well, um, at ICMR, many of you would be aware that ICMR being the apex body has always played a very leading role from a long time in setting up the ethical requirements and guidelines and standards in the country. And we have the National Ethical Guideline for Biomedical and Health Research, which was released in 2017. And uh, of course, it, that is in relation to biomedical health research and not uh, in relation to practice or healthcare. Uh, but in the guidelines, the issues uh, there uh, have been uh, already addressed related to, of course, the ethical principles would remain the same. And there are there is a special special section which talks about data and uh, data sets and biobanking where um, uh, how the data need to be acquired, how it needs to be managed, how it needs to be shared and how um, it has to be, um, how collaborations have to work have been discussed. So some of the principles of course can be drawn for those guidelines but then we all understand that as science is evolving so fast there's a need for regulations and guidelines also to keep catch up with the technology uh, platforms that are coming. And talking about ethics in the area of uh, AI, we have to be, you know, there are several adjectives that we have to keep in mind because uh, um, when we are looking for a country, like from the Indian perspective, if I speak of, we have a very diverse population. And it's like Dr. Bhattacharya, uh, some um, um, 
Dr. Samir Brahmachari mentioned that uh, you know India has a different set of problems where we have people we are talking about countries where uh, which are dealing with low or middle income range countries, low resource countries, the settings of the populations, the cultural and social requirements may be very different. The way uh, the educational status is, the way understanding of the population about artificial intelligence and its use in healthcare is maybe very misleading or may not be inaccurate. And therefore, when we build up these systems, we have to work along with the populations to see what are the needs and requirements of the country, keeping the human element in the center. When we develop the technology, it's very important to talk about the human interface as the primary importance and to make sure their, their rights and uh, are safeguarded and there may be issues related to uh, concerns or if there are any uh, issues related to liabilities if there is any harm that comes to them then how do we take care of this who will be liable those are the kind of some of these other issues that we have to see and when these systems are evolved uh, we need to build into um, monitoring and oversight because when it is done in a research setting, we know there is an ethics committee, but when we are talking of healthcare, there is no ethics committee, there is no monitoring system in place. So how do you ensure that there is adequate oversight or monitoring and uh, the liability clauses are taken care of? And the, to ensure that uh, the technology is used in a way that there is sustainable growth and inclusive growth where uh, different populations can also be taken into consideration. So that's I think you know, you know, I, I just reminds me that how many of us use Google, all of us, right? And very often we realize that you can't take a right turn because there is a signal that's come. But do we fire Google? We keep using Google. So my argument is no regulatory will work. People will decide. Future is not in the hand of government or regulation. It is people will decide to use the tool or not to use the tool. Now, I'm sure uh, Mahajan Clinic is not there in interior of Bihar or Orissa, but work of Mahajan Clinic on X-ray detection, which you are talked about the publication in Lancet, actually can help a novice technician whose X-ray can travel and it can be interpreted. So. I think one has to think what we can do best. Develop a test system for right? that. So therefore, my point is assurance of quality of data becomes primary. You cannot question that. When you are building a tool, then everybody agrees on it. But I will suggest that people who think that doctors of India will write down and fill up your data sheet, they are totally wrong. They need voice-based app. Voice-based app is the future. If you can develop voice-based app, doctors will give the data. Don't expect them to try. And I will suggest that, you know, we need to look at AI to reach sophistication. It not only gives an interpretation, it gives an explanation. Just like a good doctor not only prescribes a medicine, but tells you, why you need this medicine to be taken. But we know very well, 95% of the doctors are not who explains why you take this medicine. Am I right on this? So I will open it up, you know, if anybody has any comment, especially Dr. Onurak sitting here, or if you have something to say. Because he is the national coordinator of AI and health on behalf of the Niti Aayog. So I think one point you made very well is that Indian data sets are very unlikely to be made by medical doctors annotating things. And the question I usually ask is, do you know a good quality doctor with lots of spare time on their hands? And the usual answer is no. There are only two ways this will occur. Either you will have to incentivize them or pay them, or you would have to use additional medical manpower, such as students, residents, get them trained in specific tasks, some kind of innovative data model would need to be created for India, or we'll never have high quality, large annotated data sets the way the West had. I would, however, say that the problem of very large data sets, 
these days is being diminished by newer methods like GAN that I talked about. But at the end, you will find a severe difficulty in getting high quality medical doctor annotated data sets, especially at specialist level. That's true. Yeah, uh, I think there has been a lot of discussion on data and the quality of AI tools which you have. My take on that would be that the currently available AI tools for health have not undergone the rigor which the other medical techniques and the drugs uh, which we use on day to day as clinicians. So as a clinician, I think it is very important for the AI community to bring that trust in the system so that the clinicians feel more secure in using the tools because at the end of the day, who is responsible for the diagnosis or a misdiagnosis? Is it the developer or the clinician or the researcher? That remains the question. And I think from this panel, we should be answering that question and that should be the aim of uh, such discussions uh, from ethical perspective. Uh, here is a question. So I have a question to the panel because I'm a, I would like things to be practical. Okay, at some point I would like to have a guideline that helps us to do also an assessment whether or not this is ethical or not. There are certain aspects of ethics that are based on opinions and um, law. And then there are aspects on, uh, that, are, that are ethical that can be quantified. Like is a certain population mm -hmm. sufficiently included or not? That can be a quantifiable yes. thing. So, and then there are AI tools that provide us answers like explainability tools or uncertainty, um, quantification tools, etc. <laughs> so, so, in order to make a step forward in this field, but there, shouldn't we start, you know, categorizing the ethics aspects into either this is an opinion thing or this is a legal thing or this is a quantifiable thing and if it's quantifiable how do we quantify it whether the thresholds or this or the steps um and then also the other one is but and then the, which ai tools are the ones that serve ethical purposes to validate it's ethical etc wouldn't that be an exercise that we should be doing yeah i think uh, it's a very good point uh, where what applicable and that's what is the issue are we discussing about the device or discussing about the application process you know this question comes every time when we come up with a new technology its predictive power and potential risk of failure uh, I, I often say that isn't it blood pressure measurement has certain amount of fuzzy logic by which you take a decision that your blood pressure is actually responsible for giving some medicines. I will say the AI, you know, I want to give a one example where ICMR and Indian Health Ministry spends a billion dollars for last 10 years, 15 years, till 2000 from the DOT program of TB. We screen 40 million patients spending $10 a patient, $400 million, and we pick up 1.9 million patients and still miss about a million patients. If you have to do this whole, you need to screen 100 million patients at a billion dollar cost. Now, if you are to get all of them, the point has come now here. Can you give me a device where I can see presumptive patients and send to for test based on AI-based, cloud-based, cuff using a mobile phone, right? That is needed. That's a real solution. I am not starting treatment on that. But I am only finding the patient who can be reached to the nearest dot center. This is India's first requirement. How do we... And personally, I handle 87,000 TB patients of Karnataka. I have 53 million patients' data of Karnataka. I look at digitally. So I give this challenge. Anybody <coughs> comes up and gives, we'll be delighted to take it up. You know, Dr. Thapritish, we will talk about it. So this is 
India's challenge, which is not Western challenge. The moment you implement this Indian challenge, the next place will be taken is 17,000 island Indonesia. Every data you have a Lancet publishes is on Jakarta. It is not Indonesia. Where nobody goes and sees what's happening in TV in Indonesia. Being a part of the UNDP program, I know how sad is the situation. We are 17,000 island, you don't get data. So we need data, accurate data, curated data. And that's, I think, the challenge. And therefore, it is important that, yes. So, uh, hi, uh, I'm Dr. Vidur Mahajan. Uh, I run uh, Caring, which is a small research group just down the road. Uh, so my question is then, so essentially, so what you're saying is that uh, unsupervised AI in resource constrained regions uh, crossing a certain performance threshold uh, can be applied and the developers would not have to face liability for when AI goes wrong? It up to sending to a doctor. No, sir, let's Our say there course, is an algorithm that can, has uh, 99. If you, flag, if you can yeah. flag, I think you are beyond liability. Hmm. If you can flag that this X-ray needs a doctor to see there is a potential TB patient or potential okay. other disease. No problem. Up to that machine you give us. The reason is simple. 27B of TRIPS agreement, India is protected on diagnostic procedure, non-patentable. 27B protects us. Any diagnostic procedure, non-patentable in India. If you follow. So therefore, anybody can develop any patent is not applicable to India. That's interesting. So you have to use that loophole and make sure you make it inclusive. Otherwise, it will become very expensive. No, but sir, false negatives will... So we spend a lot of our time figuring out a 100% negative predictive value. At your value. point, yes. At your point, if the X-ray is coming from rural India to you and to say go to the district hospital to see the doctor and a specialist, yes, but then there's no radiologist in the village. So it, it is as good as a general presentation is talking about a radiologist's job. So you have to develop that is a bad. system of referral and seeing what it's done. Yeah, you can't yeah. say, mission yeah. will decide. Yeah. Yes, I think we have to close this session. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I think probably I think now last, we have to last say, comment from Dr. Sharif, and I think we'll have to close the session. We are already 10 minutes over the schedule. So now it emerges that we have to look at the ethics to be framed fr at three different levels. One is a public health level. Probably they can be a bit lax, like uh, the chairperson has suggested. And the second may be a, a doctor-mediated AI solutions where then when things go wrong, you know, they, they may go wrong because of the faulty content or because of the wrong usage by the doctor. Okay, so those things have to be addressed. And then unattended AI, which is direct AI to the patient. And then when things go wrong, like false negative. See, uh, uh, X-ray film needs to be referred to the doctor, but the AI missed it. That is the situation. So I think we'll have to, we'll have to, yeah. we will have to look at ethics from these points of view, three different points of view. Sir, I would just like to respond to Dr. Vedur. Dr. Vedur, it will never be an unsupervised. So the healthcare worker is there who's getting support of an AI tool to get the interpretation. And it is he who explains to the patient that, well, there is something wrong and please go to the doctor. So this is, it's not that the patient is like what uh, Dr. Sharif said, that uh, the patient is making diagnosis himself. No. So there is a you know, person who's operating yeah. the machine. So it's, it's like, it's basically gap versus need. So no doctor, we need to have an AI tool. But the need, you have to prioritize. You can't have an AI. You may not have an AI for a skin disease, but you need to have an AI like the, you know, uh, monitoring the advanced pregnancy for, for you know, uh, early preventing the state of so, so those are the needs that we need to prioritize. And of course, like reading the x-rays. I thank, thank you, all, thank all you. the panelists and uh, audience for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you.
here thank the chairs and the, the panelists of the session so we're going to have a next panel discussion on regulatory and we're going to have the next panel discussion on regulatory aspects of their health and i would uh, request uh, dr sameer ganjari sir uh, again to chair the session and invite dr naomi lee uh, to co chair Mr. Matthew um, Wilford from Common Health Malaysia, Ms. Deepa Tiyagi from Telecommunication Engineering Center India, and Dr. Manishri Vipandya from uh, ICMR. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Sameer sir and Dr. Naomi to uh, start the session. Sir. Anyway, Oh, no. Okay. Is Dr. Mira Jones? I got my name. <laughs> I don't know whether to thank Manjula, but again, given the job, I understand Dr. Somani, drug controller of India, is not available. So I'm doing proxy for him. Uh, but I don't mind because I have been part of the uh, drug controller support team uh, to allow first compulsory licensing. And when biotech, similar thing, I was the member of the drug controller. So I had the experience of bios when the bio similar came, whether it's biocons product, there was so much of human time. Because we first time went into from chemical molecule to biological molecule. So I'm sure AI will have this. So I request Dr. R. S. Sharma, ICMR Synergy, to start. Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank the organizer and this is specific reference to uh, our senior financial advisor, uh, Sri Rajiv Raji, for giving me this opportunity. Basically, I'm a reproductive health specialist. I don't know much about the, this subject, but when our senior financial advisor asked me to present knowledge I have gathered, this is between, I think, within the big times I gathered it. Now, <clears throat> okay. so for the, uh, this artificial intelligence is concerned since morning, we have heard a lot of about the artificial intelligence. So I don't want to repeat the definition what is it, but as in the morning also it was uh, discussed or mentioned, that artificial intelligence is a new marketplace reality. It's already in the already there around the globe, including in this country. The increase in computing power, improved algorithms, and 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 the availability of the massive amount of the data and transforming the societies around the globe. According to the International Data Corporation, that is IDC. Uh, the artificial intelligence uh, market is expected to hit around US dollar 38.8 million in 2019, which is almost 44% high, higher than the last year, that is to 2018. The IDC has also projected global spending on AI to double by 2020, reaching to almost 79.2 billion US dollar. Now, this is 
the issues which attracted the attention of government of india to also and the ministry of commerce and industry government of india established a task force a task force on ai to leverage the artificial intelligence for economic benefit and provide policy recommendation on the development of ai for india and this report was released uh, in uh, 21st of the march 2018 now uh, the reports basically attempts to answer the following three questions which are i thought this very very important as a whole um, country and rather the whole group what are the area where government should play a role then the how can the ai improve the quality of the life and solve the problem of the indian citizen and what are the sectors that can generate employment and growth by use of artificial intelligence now uh, when i look in these two documentation that is the tar, tar report of the uh, uh, commerce ministry and the niti ayog which our member of the uh, niti ayog today morning mentioned that there are differences which means i noticed that a task force identified 10 areas where the niti ayog identify only five area but fortunately the health certainly is very one of the important area and which is uh, already there now ai in the healthcare since morning we are hearing there are number of issues the, under the ai now if i go one by one i think that will take a lot of time but uh there are uh, i identify, identify around 10 areas where which are very very important and where ai certainly can play an important role and what are those the managing medical reports and other data in the morning also it was discussed and after after lunch session also the data is very important because what is the raw material for this whole is the data so the quality of data which also i consider this very very rather the paramount important in like other in the small study or big study the quality of data how you are going to collect this data compile analyze information all these things are very very important then next is the doing repeated jobs certainly we analyze the test x sir there is some issue with the audio then the precision medicine for the personal medicine the genetics and genomics dr bhimchari is the expert for that uh, genomics looks for the mutation and links to the disease uh, from that information in dna and with the help of ai uh, body scans can spot cancer and vascular disease early and predict the health issues people might be facing for that this thing 
Then the health monitoring in general, we know the, what is your blood pressure, what is your blood sugar, all these things can be um, monitored and the signal can go to the doctor and can certainly say that yes, you are at, at risk, so you can take, please take care of that. Then the healthcare system analysis, like in Netherlands, almost 97% of the healthcare invoice, uh, invoices are digital. And uh, a Dutch company used AI to, uh, to shift through the data to highlight the mistake to the treatment. So this is all already going on. This, this uh, background is perfectly all right. Because when we talk about the regulation, because I involved in the regulation, developing the guideline for the country, like for the uh, big, big industry, the assistant of the technology, or uh, the, even the EMF regulation, I'm very closely associated with the uh, Department of Tele Telecommunication when I was drafting the guideline for exposure of the EMF uh, um, radiation pro emitted from cell phone and cell phone tower. So any technology certainly brings some threat. So we need to regularize them. So there is certainly a threat for that also. And then this is a, a, a artificial intelligence in an unregulated environment will lead to a loss of human supervisory control and unfortunate outcome. So that's why there is a need to have a regulation. There is a need to have a regulation. Now, uh, I have designed some question when I was discussing on that part and thinking that what are the possible question which because I believe that when we talk about or discuss about the regulation, regulation is a very big tie. It, it then you have to take work for years together to find out because it, there has to be continuous dialogue and discussion, identify various questions, find out their solution and, and that, is, that too from various stakeholders. It's not the few people sitting there in, in the room and can develop the guidelines and the regulation. No. The, when I developed the guidelines for the ART, we conducted around seven public debate in the whole country, the different part of the country. Then we have a discussion with different in ministries of government of India, whether they are related or not, but they sometime, and you get a beautiful ideas from there. So therefore, this is a big, big challenge, but I just find out some question. And the first was, what are the key consideration for artificial intelligence policy making in India? And they are, I just I like first is the democratize the AI technology and the data. Then the rethinking intellectual property regime. This is very important when we talk about the um, in, encouraging the innovation in particular in this area. AI data storage and their security. That is also very important. AI networking and infrastructure, which is not there, but certainly we have to look into this and we will think about how we are going to do. Then second question, what are the key points to be considered for the artificial intelligence regulations? That is the transparency, which certainly when we talk about the ethics, it was discussed. The accountability and the liability, that is also very, very important. And fairness, the benefits of the AI-based tool should also reach the, the data source on which the AI was trained. The next question was, uh, what, what are the guidelines to be maintained for the algorithm of the AI in healthcare? There are a number of issues comes here, like uh, which I notice in the literature, like advocacy, lawful uh, granularity, the data ownership, the challengeable, the accuracy, the responsible, the ex and the explainable. So all these small, these are big issues, and when we look into this part of the regulation, when we talk about the regulation, all these small issues needs to be address, discuss appropriately, and, and, and identify the appropriate uh, tools for that. Then should regulation or the product be based upon the process for the development, such as the minimum database standards um, and clinician involvement or on the quality of the output? The answer, so far I was unconcerned, the regulators need to focus on two broad issues in the tandem, that is the process correct, and is the and the content correct both aspect will bring fresh challenges as ai by its very nature is dynamic additional aspects are the dissemination of the results and the manner of uh, housing the data the next one the artificial intelligence will need high quality labels data from electronic health records is it clinician response responsibility to make sure all the data is, uh, is recorded in a standardized mechanism um, uh, or then this is it is programmer responsibility. 
digitize it, train a machine with the data collected by clinician as per their finer knowledge of their patient. I thought for the detection of the melanin using public, because melanin, like in Europe, is very prevalent, quite prevalent compared to the country like India. But in India, the incidence lags, but the death rate is high. So how we, we will be able to do so? So how we are going to handle such type of diseases? I work in the contra area of family planning, contraception. There are certain contraceptives where the people from the Caucasian region or the Africans are, they are more responsive in compared to the Asians. How we are going to address these issues? So this, this seems to me that, yes, the machine learning is data dependent. So this can be one of the drawback of this system. Uh, but I, I consider that I think we have to work outside. We have to find out the solution for that. Then on whom will the accountability and liability would be affixed in case of the AI related uh, breach? And the answer generally on the algorithm developer, who is the responsible for that? Or, or the companies providing the services, but depending on the nature of the process of certain media. Then can the developer of the AI seek the protection or their uh, against copyright finger? Yes, unless a creator had an extensive role in the, uh, the AI machine or what they can see copyright protection. Are the laws and their implementation sophisticated enough to ensure the adequate comfort and consumer where AI is involved? While data privacy law provides protection against misuse of the data, these law and their implementation may not be sophisticated enough to ensure adequate control consumers where the AI is involved. Should AI notify as the medical device? Yes. Because this is, uh, though there are no, so many softwares are coming, but I think it is so key. What type of government interventions are required to stop the misuse of all healthcare? The appropriate certification is required because this is very important, particularly in the country and the government of India's issue is concerned. The last question, which I would like to flag here, this is not I want to escape it, because this is a um, device. Generally, we are going to use the cell phone or the towers or the uh, desktop, and all are the source of uh, electromagnetic radiations. And we know the radiations are, because I work in this area of electromagnetic radiations, they are to be carcinogen, means the, they are possible carcinogen. When we are framing the re regulatory aspects, then we have to address that issue of the safety of this, these tools which we are going to create around us or create around the people, particularly in the context of when we know that our people have got a different type of bone mineral density, muscles density, the environmental factor, all these factors are very, very important. Though this answer is very difficult currently at this moment, though the data is inconclusive, but certainly the people has to think in this direction also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, you know, when people say we have to worry about all this, I wonder, the risk of being living in Delhi with the pollution is few million times higher than the radiation cost of carcinogen on my uh, uh, mobile phone. So you have to understand the context. You know, we are not talking about Sweden, right? We are talking about India, and this is Delhi, capital of India. You understand? So health is a very subjective issue, and a relatively living we are doing. This is like a friend of mine in Kajana who smokes and asks me whether or not processed meat is a carcinogen. <laughs> uh, can I ask the next uh, part? I think, as per the list, needed. Okay. This is on, actually. Sorry, some mic challenges. So I hope uh, for all those uh, AI people out there, you're not scared away with uh, Dr. 12, 13 pointer, because if I was a developer, I would have said, you know, I don't want to do this. Um, I want to get out of this business. Um, I just, just a quick, uh, I'm going to take a few minutes. Sir. I know we are uh, running out of time. You know, regulation is going to be critical. We will need to regulate at some extent. But the risk we have is that if we decide to get into this and try to overregulate, uh, we are going to definitely stunt creativity. So Absolutely. you know we need to be careful. In fact, uh, from our point of view, or the thinking that we have is that uh, the regulation probably should be based on the use case, probably should be based very strongly on the risk that is at hand for the specific uh, you know interventions or the specific solutions that we're developing. 
um it's a it's it's actually a sexy word ai everybody wants to talk about ai everybody wants to jump into ai uh, most of us including myself probably don't understand what we're talking about but if we start looking at solutions we find that there are some very very simple tools that could really help especially a country like india where we've got a large population but uh, screening for example with ai yes uh, definitive diagnostics probably not yet yes um, you know uh, clinical decision making support advisory yes clinical decision making no probably not no probably not yet not yet. i say yet because you know technology is changing every day absolutely and the regulation would evolve also accordingly so you know my my uh, our take would be that the regulation should be very simple it should be very encouraging to developers to come in and really get involved because there is a lot of scope there is a lot of advantage that a country like india with a large population with a large burden of disease we could use some of these tools for that initial screening process very very quickly and have a huge impact we could use it give it to our ashas who could actually start building some sort of a clinical pathway right at the front end uh, right where that is um, the challenge that we have to keep watching out is for the false negatives but at the moment there are no positives or negatives you know so if you're talking about an asha worker if you talk about a false negative of 5 or 6 in 100 at the moment it's all negative so let's let's move a little bit i'm sure as we move forward the algorithm gets better and sharper and we can move towards that direction finally i think uh, you know uh, if we are going to move in that direction there is no liability issue that comes in uh, because we are not doing definitive di diagnostic we are not doing uh, actual procedure based on uh, ai based uh, uh, thing so what the regulation should really be looking at is what is the risk of this tool what could be the advantage what is the downside and based on that let's come up with some sort of guide absolutely fantastic uh i will you know if you segregate see, uh, dr narayan murthy made a statement that when it was started export actually government did not know which ministry to go so uh, you know software was treated as makmal like cloth in there so nobody bothered it was gone it grew then came our regulatory icity technology and today all our industries in telecom are in debt <coughs> so therefore i am very scared of government making regulation right government should be although i worked as government secretary but i am still telling we should be enabler we should make sure our job is to protect the patients therefore we have to divide ai regulation diagnostic healthcare support system much before we move into treatment or direction analysis i think one place where it will come very well is policy decision if the data is good so there we don't need government can get policy to know what need to be done if you can support with ai and provide the data so my request next to our malaysian friend matthew gelfort common health great uh, thank you very much can you hear me yes. okay great uh, so first of all thank you very much for being here today it's, it's great to be on this panel as well um, i'll try to cover three things in my remarks so one is a bit of just framing a background what is common health how would it be related to the space a little bit on what we see as some of the implications around principles on the regulatory side for AI. Um, and then a couple of thoughts on kind of way of work and how we can think about the process from a regulatory perspective. Um, so, you know, just to start by echoing Sumaya uh, during her talk earlier today, um, I was in New York a few months ago at the UNGA and the big theme is UHC. Um, and there's a massive ambition around how do we get everybody covered how do we ensure that everybody has access to essential health services that we're addressing healthcare financing 
Um, but at the same time, if we see the latest report from the World Bank a couple months ago, we have a projected $176 billion health financing gap in 2030 in LMICs. And so we think that that means we have to do three things, um, none of which are small. We have to change how we pay for health care. We have to change how we deliver health care. And we have to change how people engage with and define health in their daily lives. Um, and so what I've been working on over the past five years, first in Bangladesh, in Dhaka for five years now, based in Malaysia, working across the region, is looking at three dimensions. So one is around health engagement. How do we start to change behaviors on health? Second is looking at how can we deliver primary care in innovative ways, especially through mobile phones. And the third is how can we think about new models for health insurance? Um, and if you'll bear with me, I'll talk a bit about health insurance at I think 4.30 in the afternoon, right before a tea break. So I know, I know health financing is not the most exciting topic in the world, but um, you know, it, it's one that I think can be high leverage. And just to talk a bit about what AI means for health insurance. So um, we've used AI in a couple different ways. Uh, so we built the largest health insurance program in Bangladesh. Um, one is around the front end. So can we use AI to look at things like chatbots to improve that front end experience of claiming health insurance, tracking where claims are. Um, this has potentially really interesting implications for things even like Oshman Barak, right? About how do we run those programs? The second is looking at fraud, which people don't tend to like to speak about a lot when it comes to health insurance, but it's a serious issue. And using AI to, to detect fraud so we can manage risk is, is quite important. Um, so I think in addition to all the other examples that folks mentioned as far as primary care, as far as behavior change, we think there's a real role for AI in health financing as well. Uh, just really quickly, a couple of principles on what that might mean on the regulatory side. So I think it's basically three things. So the first, and this is something yours that you touched on, we have to get the scope right. Um, and I think there's a big difference, as the chair said, between clinical decisions, clinical activities, and non-clinical activities. And I think, you know, clinical, clinical activities, there's a big debate there, that debate should continue. Non-clinical activities, can we carve those out and say, we want as much innovation as possible, as much efficiency as possible. So again, one, get the scope right. Um, two, I think we need to get the balance right. And what I mean by that is there's always going to be this tension between um, risk on one side and innovation and accessibility, and I would argue universality on the other side. Um, and you know, I think we heard from a lot of folks um, sitting here in, in Delhi. Um, not sitting here in the US or in Geneva, right? That that balance is going to be different depending upon where we're working and those priorities will be different. And we need to give space for regulators to make their own decisions as far as how we, we balance that. Um, I guess the third thing that I would just say, and this also came up, um, is we should use real benchmarks. And what I, what I mean by that is um, we want to hold AI to high standards. We want good actors in this space, but also we should be real about the context in which we're working, right? So I agree that the bar should not be better than nothing, but also the bar should be appropriate to the quality of care that's provided. I'll give you one example. So there was a study, I think it was in the BMJ, uh, not, not in the Lancet, sorry Naomi, um, that was around the average length of a primary care consultation face-to-face. -face. And the average length of a primary care consultation in Bangladesh is 47 seconds, right? Um, India is hopefully a bit longer than that, but probably not by much, right? So again, how, how can we use AI to ensure that that doctor's time is used on the most valuable activities? Uh, the last point I'll just leave with on, lay of on way of work. Uh, someone quoted Tagore, I think, earlier today. Um, I'll quote one of my favorite poets from the US, Robert Frost. Um, I think we need to take the road less traveled, uh, as he says. And I think there's potentially a new way of work, and, and I'd be curious about your views on this RS, around do we need to think about a regulatory process that's different for these types of technologies compared to what we've looked at before? And, and maybe there's a role to say actually government's job is to articulate goals and priorities, outcomes that they want, but then also to create enough space for experimentation and then use that data to then assess where we go next. Uh, because I'm frankly skeptical especially given the current climate in the US, uh, about the ability of government to stay ahead of these issues, right? Unless we find new ways of, of governing regulations. So I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, very nice points. And I think uh, while we are going for 500 million people for Aishman Bharat, 
I think your argument of uh, application of AI to manage the risk of fraud, I think it's very, very important. And I think that's a good business opportunity. Those who want to have a startup, you can start working right away uh, on that and see how the business can be done there. I have no problem. You make any amount of money in that business, but don't make money out of poor patients. That's the whole argument. Technology should be made available for the poor. Now, can I request the next to make one comment, Deepa Tyagi, and then we move on to the next person. Yeah, hi. I belong to an organization called Telecom Engineering Center, which is the standards body of the telecom uh, department. <coughs> and uh, I handle future networks. So I've been uh, studying very closely developments happening in 5G, AI. And uh, what we find is that these are all enablers, communication technologies and even AI, AR, VR. These are all enablers which cut across multiple sectors. So now since the theme here is uh, health, so 5G and AI, they are going to be enablers for uh, health. Now recently, while I was studying this, I sort of Googled and uh, read a lot of documents and a lot of policy decisions that have been happen taking, being taken place in US and all. So US, uh, uh, American Medical Association, they have just recently, I think in 2018, they had come out with an AI policy which said, that AI should be a very well thought of, well designed, clinically validated, and a very high quality AI. That is what is the policy. Now, recently, just about a month back, they have further amended it. And the four broad guiding principles are that the aim of AI, the AI should be quadruple. It should enhance patient experience of care and outcome. It should improve population health and it should reduce costs while increasing value to the customer. And fourth, and very importantly, it should support professional satisfaction of the physicians and healthcare providers. So the, if you look at these four broad uh, uh, frameworks, so in that context, I think uh, since I come from the telecommunication side, I would like to say that AI frankly depends upon the quantity of the amount and the quality of data that goes into the system. So data, as we said, we need to have a very robust ecosystem of data and the five uh, R's of data are, the data should be very rich, you know, rich in terms of context, rich in terms of attributes, rich in terms of dimensions. Then it should be reconcilable. It should be robust. It should be It should be relevant. Now, in the realm of uh, big data and metadata, there's a lot of data, a lot of it which may not be even relevant. So, depending upon the query or the patterns that you're looking into, there should be some kind of a data on tap that you have the entire data, but based on the query or based on the research or based on the patterns that you want to see, you should have the data available. So, what is desirable, of course, this is a utopian concept, Except it looks utopian at this point in time. We need to have a patient-centric, vendor-independent, unified data platform from which different organizations or different hospitals, different organizations who are working on AI algorithms, they can just take data based on their requirement. Third, of course, is the data collection. Now, data collection in the case of, say, remote patient management, you're supposed to collect data from the customer, from the patients. Now, you need sensors. Now, the quality of sensors, sensors as of today, are of all kinds and all shapes and at all costs. They're available in the market, but there is no regulation on the sensors. So there has to be some kind of a testing and a certification mechanism of the testers because the quality of sensor is going to decide on the quality of data that is collected. Now, once you collect the data, it has to be transported to some central location. So you need communication links. So you need, now depending upon what is going to happen at the other end, you need how quickly the data should be communicated to the remote end where you're going to process it. Or in case of say robotic surgery or something, you have things like ultra reliable and ultra latent, very low latency data. So hopefully now you've, there's been a lot of talk about 5G. So the 5G communication technology should be able to take care of a lot of these challenges of uh, communication, low latency, ultra reliable data. 
then you have a lot of new technical concepts in 5G like network slicing, where depending upon the application that you're going to use this uh, data for, you will be given preference over other voice only kind of applications. So because imagine, now there's so much of fuss in the country when there's a call drop, which is just a voice call. Now imagine if you are doing some robotic surgery from a distant location and some data is being sent to the robot from the master uh, uh, control room and suddenly the communication links snap then and the surgery goes fut. Now, who are you going to make it? I mean, who's going to be responsible for it? Is it going to be the algorithm provider or is it going to be the communication link provider who did not adhere to the SLAs that he was supposed to give? So there are so many different stakeholders, you know, from the place from where the data has been collected to the place where you're acting on that data. So there are different stakeholders and it will be extremely difficult in case something goes wrong, that how do you exactly apportion the the blame or uh, the accountability. So that is one area of challenge which we find because even the telecom service providers will come into the network because they are the ones on which their network is being used to piggyback or to transport the data. So this is one challenge. And of course, second is the certain kind of biases which can come into the algorithm. So because the biases in terms of gender, sex, socioeconomic because health is again an indicate is dependent on a lot of socioeconomic conditions also so since so it also depends upon who's written the algorithm and these biases of the human mind because i'm told that there are about 100 biases cognitive biases even in a human being so imagine a person who's writing these algorithms with these biases so it is inevitable that these biases may also creep into the algorithm. So just like we have human IQ tests and measurement mechanisms, I think we need to also think about AI quotient because AI is a very loosely used word. You know, Any processing of data, people think it's just some IT, IT work that is happening and you're just processing data and some, it's called an IE, AI. But then we need to have some kind of a grading. You, know, you need to assess the algorithm in terms of its robustness, transparency, bias free and stuff like that. So you need to have an AIQ. So these are some of the challenges, but in the end I feel that since this is not a Google download or something, this is about human beings. So they will always be a human in the loop with whatever highly advanced AI we may adopt. They will always be a human in the loop. And I think we should not get overpowered by the technology, all we need to do is get empowered by the technology. That's my take on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just want a quick comment from Dr. Uh, uh, we are uh, running out of time, so I have a chance to be on here. There is a small presentation, two, three slides. I am the only lawyer present in this, so among the August yeah. gathering. Yeah, and um, <laughs> actually, glad. it becomes uh, impotent on me. Yeah. So uh, maybe I want to connect directly to you. So one thing is yeah. we are we have we have the suggestion to output an AI software life cycle for health, okay. meaning those aspects of biases that you just mentioned uh, should be part of that uh, also. So that would be an extension of the ethical. Uh, a group that not only the data are subject to ethical uh, considerations, but also the AI software development itself and the way the metrics are set up, the testing, etc. That's one thing. The second thing you brought up is something that we have briefly discussed before, but this hasn't been yet on our agenda, which is what formats should be used to have to run a remote AI application, meaning you are acquiring here, you are transmitting data over there, uh, you get uh, a result back, and that could be in terms of um, whatever has been sent um, modified or some additional information that has been extracted. It could be like a segmented image, for example, as a feedback, or it could be uh, saying cancer present, yes, or right? So this, and to, to my, point for you made to discuss is that should we also consider remote AI applications where you have a format involved where you need to transmit things and potentially in order to be able to transmit it, compress it, 
which just brings us to our old topic that Simao and I have been working on, um, or not. That's one thing. And then the other one is the AI software life cycle that I wanted to mention that we will be working on. So I'm sorry, so Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, these are issues which are very important, the data compilation, data loss, whether there will be back to loss. All these are uh, very technical issues to be handled. We are talking regulatory. Regulatory is government. Nobody else does regulation. So government policy, will government make a law and then which will prevent innovation? So one has to be very careful. I think I've taken that uh, comments from him. That is very important. So I'm very glad to have a lawyer because it just reminds me, in 1987, there was not one Indian lawyer who knew about Gino. <laughs> so they thought I'm a lawyer. So International Bar Association meeting at Germany, at Berlin, I was invited because I was an activist. How important to patients' rights and things like that, genetic material cannot become universal happen. So I'm at least happy today <laughs> that there is one law here on AI available. I'm congratulated that for your RD entry. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If you look at the ethical pillars, what we do is do no harm, be good, justice and autonomy. When the justice component is given preponderance, we have law as a subset. So it is nothing that it is alien concept when only only thing is, as Sir just said, it is a probably a state which is going to prescribe, which is uh, going to... Um, say that what to do and what not to do and also have sanctions if you're not going to comply with those things. So, am I going to try? This side. Oh. Yeah, on the top. Yeah. This shot is the top. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, so if you look at, you know, there are many definitions of law, concepts of law, but if you look at the legal framework present in India at present for regulating AI, you will only see that it is only the Information Technology Act and the associated rules which are sitting. But they also give definitions if you look at the section two, which covers computers, computer networks, data, controller, then what is going to be um, transmission of data, so what is going to be cyber security, all the definitions are present. If you have, uh, if you had heard uh, uh, Mahmoud Swami speaking, spe speaking, she said that law comes slow, but you would have never seen a lawyer or a judge being anxious about it. So because we have all legal principles sitting on our heads, we know general clauses, we know generally how to interpret law, we know all the principles which says that what is a legal presumption if there is a evidence presented before you, there is a respondent superior, there is an agency law, there is going to be other legal principles like Bolam test in case of negligence, an expert opinion body which can be heard upon in case of a absence of a legal network or a framework. So this does not make us anxious as a legal fraternity, but definitely there has to be a law or a legal framework which has to address the ifs and buts and the consequences and compensations if applicable for this specific AI domain. So now, okay. So if you look at automation as a general subject, it has been more than over 60 years automation has crept in to a daily life. This area, this age can be called as a disruptive industrial age. This can be called as information age, but you can see industry using automation since more than 70 years now. And it is 6% deaths that have been reported till date annually because of the automation that has crept in. So compensation when courts are looking at because of automation, though it is in automobile industry, it may be in many other industries where robots or the mechanical arms are used for assembly of vehicles for other tasks, which may be routine. But when it comes death or infirmity as a result of use of this automation, courts have made their own principles. So they have compensated based on many other, I will also go into them, but I just don't want to scare you people 
but you have to be careful that these are only logical aspects which you have to take into consideration while we deal among your, your own colleagues, international partners, national partners, so that you know what you are going to put in a contract. Because in the absence of law, what makes it relevant is the individual contract between the parties which are going to implement the aspect of AI tool implementation or AI tool enablement or AI tool or, um, you know, uh, making it as a part of your survey or making it as a part of your diagnostic uh, survey and other things so that any liability that falls on you, it gets recorded in the written form between the contracts or the contracting parties. Okay. <clears throat> So if you see, these are just the cartoons, but I just want to see, uh, to tell you three modes of how regulatory frameworks work. It is command and control, command and control as Dr. Ramachandri rightly said that the state is sitting off over you. It gives you the framework. It says what to do, what not to do, punishes you if you are not going to compare, comply with that. That becomes the first approach. Next is a self-regulation approach wherein the ethical guidelines, rules and regulations of the exponential expert bodies and international agencies agencies will come in. Also, there is a co-regulation approach wherein the private international law and public international law comes into picture. So the international law, if you talk about it, there is no codified law for international law, but there is going to be again principles based on which two states will want to cooperate and act in, in consonance with each other. So there are five aspects very important on which any AI regulation is based upon. First time we have already seen is the automation, wherein the human interference reduces and the machine interference increases, how will the liability be fixed? That is one aspect. Then also the human machine interaction, like this backup. If the automation goes wrong at any point of time, what is the backup available? Who was responsible for the backup? Was the human interference at that point, which was warranted, was actually given at that point of time without any delay? So these things will form under fall under the human human machine interaction and also privacy regulation now the Putuswami case on Aadhaar which has become a landmark in our country talks about privacy of data. Our data, patient data, whatever it is, how you are going to protect the privacy which is related to the sensitivity extent of the data. If it is not sensitive, we also have a lot of national data sharing and accessibility policy, which is already placed by our government in 2012 itself, which says public investment goes into a project. The project data will have to come into public domain, but they are not talking about sensitive data. So all the policies which talks about public domain data till date remains non-sensitive data. But we are talking about AI tool being trained on sensitive data. So this becomes important for us. And social order, you see the winking Rahul Gandhi there. The social order is also about computational propaganda and the boot and the bot boosting, what we call it as, you know, the bots which act as tweet followers and brings on popularity for a political figure, changes the way the pol politics and the policy happens in any country. So the social order gets disturbed because of AI. And also we have attribution of human aid. You see two f figurines there, females, who are Sophia and Shibuya Mirai. So one is now a citizen of Saudi Arabia, that is Sophia. Another, Mirai, is the Japanese citizen. So they have been given humanhood. So they are now citizens as like you and me who have rights to sue, to be sued. So that takes away the liability of anyone, programmer, any other third party from these AI humanoids. So this is one extent in which we are now creating citizens, you know, so which, is, which are bots earlier. So this is also one concept we have to look to. So this figures from uh, Robo, iRobo and uh, our own Rajinikanth pictures you might have seen and also the Azimos, you know, sort of an imaginary law for AI which says uh, do no harm to human being. So you don't do anything which is in contravention to the first law. Even if you have to protect yourself, you take care of the first two laws. So this becomes like a you no know, rhetoric, you have heard it in movies, but then even if you are looking at everyone was saying the same thing, best interest of the user must be kept in mind when you're having AI in any part of the health law sector. Now you are looking at the legal principles now what are being put into place. Now another good thing, Dr. Neeraj, I want to tell you, the American Medical Association looked into all the telemedicine cases 
which are based on medical negligence when it was given through medical consultation that was given through telemedicine, not even a single case reported. So you need not be worried that if there is going to be a telemedicine, it is going to be AA, there is going to be, you know, some, so many law cases which are going to fall on doctors. Maybe your insurance will go up, your liabilities are going to go up. That is not the case. So anything which falls within the four pillars and the domains and perimeters of your ethical practices is going to protect you, whether it is going to be telemedicine or not. Thank you. So when we look at tort, tort is a simple civil mistake, which when you have a pet in your home and the pet bites your neighbor, you become responsible, that is taught, in simple words. So that is one legal principle. If you have an AI which you are using, you are causing harm to your patients, that is a taught principle which comes into picture. Now, agency law. If an AI tool is being used by a radiologist in remote areas who is going to look into the images and also going to determine the presence or absence of a disease, the agency law. He is acting as an agent to the principle. And legal person, this we have already seen. If this AI is given a legal person status who will become liable. So that is the third one. And product liability or professional liability are already existing principles in which the professional or the product which enters the market becomes, and uh, the manufacturer becomes liable. So now we need a Bahubali approach, definitely. So it is going to be multi-prong at institution level, at national level, at global level. You have to have a policy and monitoring review at institutional level. You have to have regulatory framework and you have to have an enabling ecosystem like Brahmachaisa said it should not be restrictive it should enable people facilitate growth in the sector and globally it has to be international cooperation and recognition and remedy whenever the damage happens beyond the geographical limitations of the presence of the tools or manufacture of the tools thank you sir I have finished thank you very much <laughs> I think uh, fortunately I must say that in India uh, our doctors are well respected. They're part of the family members. And I do not think I'll ever sue Dr. Balram Bhargava if I get a heart attack tomorrow. He told me you are not going to get a heart attack. You keep all the medicine. Okay. So therefore, I think in the Western context, we try to understand India, which I want to make sure that we don't do that mistake. India has to be understood in AI context for India, which may be extendable to Malaysia, Indonesia, I don't know how many countries, but not to the West. I repeat in front of American, European, that AI application to healthcare will come first in India. If you are to go to the city of Bangalore, you will be shocked to see how many posters how many companies all owing about AI, right? So my feeling is that we must have one or two questions. I will ask her to give a comment since she's sitting here and then we break for coffee. Is that okay? Yeah. So super interesting comment, really. Thank you very much for all of your, your comments. I think uh, sitting here were two kind of thoughts that emerged to me. And one is, um, that in terms of regulation, there's regulation which stifles innovation and then there's regulation which you can direct it in a positive way. And I definitely heard that there's a huge amount of skepticism among the panel in the way that regulation could be used in a positive way. Um, and uh, a kind of a challenge therefore for regulators when they're coming to this area to give uh, contributions that add value and speed up rather than slowing down innovation. And then the second theme that I heard throughout the presentations was really thinking about regulation as a balance between uh, what's international and what's local. Um, so when I consider regulation for AI, then I see some benefits in a global approach because I see therefore solutions that are developed or created in one place can then be sold or marketed in another. Um, and also that it helps with equity in different places. So the UK population pretty diverse. If you, if you train a model in the UK population, how convinced are we that it will work on the, um, you know, the Indian diaspora in the UK? So there's a kind of, you know, a benefit both ways there as populations change. But what I hear very much from the panel is, uh, no, India is very kind of a very different situation. And so really when regulation is created for AI, it has to, it has to 
to look at the specific challenges for this context. Um, so I'm really interested as we go through the next few days of the workshop to see where the kind of balance is for those, you know, uh, liberating regulation versus constrictive regulation and kind of local versus international regulation. So thanks for all your comments. It's super interesting. I learned a lot. Thank you. Is there any question? Yes. Andrew Lin. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a question on regulation of data, collated data. And I say this with the reason because I haven't got a clear answer from either panel, although Dr. Kanan came closest with open access, the requirement for metadata ontologies. Now, see, why I say this is that if you look at the Western world, you have regulation where ownership is largely in private bodies' hands, insurance companies, the Facebook kind of industry. On the other extreme, you have the Chinese model where it's all owned by the state. Now, you have Europe, and I've been watching the ECs. I think the regulation has been almost in the opposite direction. For instance, it's getting irritating to accept the cookie request for every website you look. But this is something that we have to look at because that gives ownership back to the person actually generating it. Now, what is happening with reference to health data? And do we have a model in which we can generate some sort of synthetic data set so that we can build models for it? We're all talking about applying technologies downstream, but the regulation on data, which is what we're going to build our models on, is not very clear at all, especially when you're applying it to India. Yeah, I think you are right. Uh, where you capture the data, patient owns the data until it is captured and it's given right to the user. So can I interrupt? Uh, no, I mean that the patient always owns his own data. Yeah, I'm talking means, about when it's collated and it is very rarely through I, consent. I, I give an example. Yeah. That, uh, you know, we have two major data centers uh, I work with, uh, which is the largest uh, diagnostic, Lal But I understand they did not take consent from the patients to use the data, so they cannot use it. I also interact with Bahajan Clinic. But I understand they took the consent from the day zero. So that's why they could publish the paper with the consent. So therefore, consent taking is an important component. So the patient has to give consent. This was the same thing when we collected human genome data, right? Materials. Consent of the patient for the purpose which you will utilize is a very important component. Who owns the data? This is a very complex discussion. Uh, if you go to a private hospital, they will say they own the data because it's their private procured. Can government bring a regulation to say to improve healthcare policy decision, the metadata de-anonymized should be made available? It's possible. It's possible that government can say, Apollo, Hortis, whoever you are, Mahajan, Metadata, you have to bring it out and give so that I can take a policy whether I need more hospitals in Bihar or I need cardiologists in Rajasthan or which I need. That's a government's decision. Uh, there you can be China, no problem. But primary data, non-anonymized, should be in the hand of the patient himself. If any time any data is created, patient should be able to access that data and that would be ideal situation to create a portal in which it is like a digilocker, an app I have in which all my data is sitting in that. I have a startup I mentored and there all child health record data is with the parents. It's in the cloud. Parents have an app by which they have an access and its access will be there for 12 years from the child date of child born. No, the, those are answers to what exists. I want to know what regulation can be. So, so as I say, can... government, it is the decision of the government to see for implementing a policy decision, we need metadata. Government can legislate to get a metadata. No, but government any... cannot get primary data. I am, uh, the primary data is actually part of a collated data. So it's not, it's owned by multiple people. My point is, where is the regulation to open access this data? Yeah, I mean, if you give me, if I get 100,000 cuff of TB patient versus non-TB patient, I'll make it open source. That I can guarantee you. Well, we have a talk later in the evening. <laughs> but I think actually we should look uh, forward, if you are taking this up, take up this issue a little more seriously, and because I think we need yeah, to open access. Our Malaysian friend to talk. 
So, so I guess what I would just say is, I think the other, there's a macro question around, are we waiting for government to solve this? Um, which, which is to say, I think your point around that the government should be the regulator is well taken, but at the same time, I think there also can be some interesting approaches around industry setting standards as far as how data can be used if they choose to self-adopt, right? So for example, for us, if we say, you know, actually, these are the principles that we choose to abide by. Our patients own their data. That's, that's their number one, number two, number three. And if there are standards that are set by the industry that then are voluntary, that might actually be a faster way of starting to get to this than government action. So I'm just going to Is there any last word, anybody else? Yes, I have a Thank you. So I, I just would like to make another dimension of the, our discussion. Like we are talking about the regulation of AI. But the context of US, UK, the health medical regulation, general health regulation is very strict. Doctor will follow the procedure to treating or even talking with the patient, right? But when it comes to India or Bangladesh, it's different, right? So do we actually raise our voice that we need to have a regulation of um, like doctors or medical systems in India? So in this context, I think we need to focus on context or rather regulation. Like in, in the rural India or rural Bangladesh, there is no primary health care, there is no resources, and mobile phone AI can help screen different diseases that is much better than that nothing I have. So I think uh, we are like more focusing on the regulation. I think we have to focus on the like our necessity and that um, our like service that actually really need to happen for the every citizen who actually suffering and that we, if not then they will suffer and they will reduce their productivity. Thank you. I completely with you on this issue. Uh, I just want to give a small scenario which you will understand. I do a tagliam x-ray. Doctor says heart is fine. Or I'm doing an x -ray. Then I do a CAT scan. Between 64 to 56. It says large calcium deposit. You need cardiac problem. Okay. Doctor takes me to the angiography. Based on these two information set. But before that I just have climbed. Uh, China wallet, and I got that hero certificate. Then doctor puts me to angiography, then suddenly realize that my arteries are wider than average Indian arteries. Okay, so since I'm a busy worker those days, so he puts the stent. I don't sue anybody. He realized that stent might not have been required because that two dimensional CAD data when converted into angiograph data, giving my arteries being thicker, is okay, 60% block would not have cost something. Whom I will sue? Which technology is responsible, right? As long as in human anatomy will be variable, your genome is different than my genome, there is nothing definitive in healthcare, right? Your thinking to get cure, is better than my thinking to get cured. All technology will be only a assisted help. We have to see that there is no voodoo's, right? People don't give you some saying, this take this pill and you will be suddenly slim. It happens though, no? all over internet it is there. So therefore AI must not be taken that. That's the regulation. That part is the only regulation. But I will be very happy if mobile phone based ECG saves life. Yeah, to add with one thing with you, like our doctors in India or Bangladesh is very busy because they have to handle many patients. Sure. It's not like UK or US. Mm. So in that context, AI could be the assistant or to the doctor to give the second opinion to have a better treatment for the Got patient and it. Treatment. And that will reduce the human error. So I think if we take that context, that is the better for AI and rather it's suppressing through the regulation. Agreed. Thank you. It's been an absolutely fantastic discussion. We're going to close now so that at least everyone gets a chance to drink their coffee, go to the bathroom. But this is really in thanking the panel, thanking the chair for a really great session. Thank you. Thank you.
Boom, nice to meet you. Wonderful, wonderful. 